The topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Welcome back, everyone, to the Geek Skeezers and Googleization Show, where we talk with HR and business thought leaders about all the crazy shift going on in the world of HR, recruitment, and business. I'm your host, Ira Wolf, and I'm joined again by my co-host, Keith Compagna, and sponsors, Jobvite and Success Performance Solutions. We are talking all about the future today, but first, we're going to go back into history to see if history will repeat itself. Our guest is going to be uh, Frank Diana. He just released a series of blog posts that caught my attention about convergence, and we talk about the convergence uh, of, of the wired, the tired, and technology yeah. all the time, Keith. So yeah. we'll hear more from Frank in uh, just a few minutes. Uh, before we dive into the show today, this, uh, we well, just want to remind everybody we're recording live. Uh, you can chat with us uh, on W4CY.com. Uh, just click on, if you go to 4CY.com, W4CY.com, uh, click on the Listen Live, and then in the upper left, there's a button for chat. So you can send us your questions, or you can call us, 561-623-9429. That's 561-623-9429. Uh, you can also download the W4CY app on your phone, if that's uh, it's probably the easiest way to get there. Does that? Yeah, actually, I do. Really? A couple of people. I that, hope that, so. Yeah, good, I met with, uh, the geez, the I, I met with somebody station. yesterday, and he, he said, hey, I listen on Spotify, but he actually had uh, W4CY uh, as well. Nice. Hey, um, just uh, we, a couple of giveaways here. I mean, we, I just launched a, a free book giveaway. If you want to get some information, go to up to the website. I'll put this on the Geeks and Geezers, too, but um, it's at success performance solutions.com uh, forward slash RAG, which is for recruiting in the age of Googleization. So it's the website forward slash W, I can't talk, RAG dash book dot dash giveaway. So I'm going to make it easier and we'll put it up on the website. But and it's anyway, a great book yeah. for those of you who haven't gotten a chance yeah. to pick it up yet. It's so very, yeah, get a chance to futuristic. win a free one. Look, there's a little hitch to it, but you'll have to read read that page. <laughs> Um, Keith, you and I were talking before you yep. were, you were stuck in kind of crazy traffic. Um, we were talking about some of the crazy shift going on in the world. Um, you know, kind of what a weird week. I mean, it's been a great week for me, but weird. I was invited to talk to five, uh, to five it's events. Happening. Yeah. Um, next week, uh, I mentioned this last week and, and next week, uh, Wednesday, actually we're doing the show between two sessions, mm-hmm. uh, a bright talk. It, uh, that's bright T A L K. Um, it's for it's a two day summit on HR technology. It's called HR Technology 2.0. Nice. Um, you can register for free. Uh, I'm doing a session on keeping the human in HR, uh, recruiting and age of Googleization, and then Thursday. That's Wednesday and Thursday um, on a panel, uh, two panels, one for corporate culture, mm-hmm. uh, and one for people analytics. And then got invited to talk at PA Sher- Pennsylvania Sherm in September, Delaware Sherm in November, Philadelphia Sherm sometime. October. I think uh, no, I think uh, I think this is going to be a, a, a boot camp. Oh. I think we're going. Oh, I think it's going to really? be in the winter. Yeah. And then I told you about the Saudi Arabia deal, yeah. which I don't know how that's going to work because I've got some other commitments, but we'll <laughs> deal with that. Um, did two pot did a podcast yeah. yesterday doing a podcast after this yep. was quoted in a couple of publications i mean it just went on and on and how then, you feeling with all this celebrity you holding uh, it together yeah it's uh hey you know if i was 22 it'd be great <laughs> yeah, be a little bit <laughs> better. The, the millennials thriving the, the baby boomer part is struggling a bit <laughs> <laughs> so yeah and uh, in fact after the show um I'm, I'm doing a podcast with uh diane uh hamilton and uh, she released the book on, it's called The Curiosity Code. Mm. And uh, there's an assessment, which obviously attracted my attention. And, you know, I've, you know, basically with my clients, I talk about how curiosity is just a, a huge need, which fits mm-hmm. under our topic today about, oh, yeah. you know, why, why would somebody even go into futurism and just being curious is, is a component of that. Uh, and uh, so that's, that'll be exciting. And um, 
you know, and we're booked through November with, I know we, we just, I mean, it, it's Folks, been great. Folks, do you hear the guests that we have on the show? I think maybe what I'll do over the weekend is put together a, a post that just lists out yeah, all the and people. We're, and we're going to, I'm going to, it's, it's halfway done, but I, I it's going to go up on the website too. Yeah. There'll, be a, there'll be a schedule of, of that. Now that we've thank got, you to everybody. Yeah. Now that we've got everybody's podcast up yep. there. So yep. we're, we're up to date. Uh, and I can't wait to get uh, today's up there. Yeah, so before we sure. before we jump over to, to Frank, because this is going to be fun, uh, what uh, what's going on with you? Well, I'm right up there with you. I think I'm getting there. Um, I've, I was on two podcasts last week. They're in production. They're going to let me know when they go live. Um, the uh, HROI software is all done. I'm talking okay. right now with you know business partners building that that's done being built out. So we're looking to release that. And then with LifeWork integration, the momentum is building. Uh, I might be bringing in my second client, my first oh, corporate nice. client. Very good. Um, soon. I don't talk about those things until it happens for with okay. details. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, things are going great. And, and something tells me that they're, they're, they're going to get a little bit nuttier. Everything is exponentially growing anymore. It is, uh, that, which leads us right up to today's topic, yep. that exponential change. Uh, our guest today I mentioned earlier was is Frank Diana. Uh, I've not met personally, but we had a bunch of chats over LinkedIn and, and email over the last couple of weeks. Um, I, I watched a whole bunch of videos. Uh, it's it's uh, at the gym. Mm-hmm. Uh, makes 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 the stairmaster go a lot faster. It sure does. Uh, and uh, Frank is a, you know, his LinkedIn profile says he's a speaker, a leader, and a futurist. Uh, he's currently the managing partner at Tata Consulting Services. Uh, I was introduced to Frank, as I said, just a couple of weeks ago, um, through indirectly through some a mutual friend. We're talking about the digital world and, and networking. Um, Gerd Leonhard uh, became a fan of his about a year and a half ago, two years ago. Saw some videos, picked up his book, uh, a couple of them. One that is, as you just picked yeah, up, and it's mostly it's mostly it. yellow now. It's mostly highlighted. Uh, I got a couple different versions of it. Uh, Gerd Leonhard. Uh, and uh, he's just a good guy, and he was talking about technology versus humanity. Uh, that's the title of his book, too. That happened to be on on Frank's list of book yeah. recommended books yeah. that he sent me, uh, too. And uh, that's that was the genesis for the keeping the human in HR. Yeah, in our How program. About it? So, and uh, just kind of spawned a a whole new perspective. Um, Really intrigued by Frank, Frank's perspective on the future, um, and we'll definitely be talking about the future of work. Uh, again, watched a bunch of his videos, reached down to LinkedIn, and here he is. So we're going to be talking about communication in this digital world and a whole bunch of other things. Down the rabbit hole we go. Yeah. Frank, welcome to Geek Skeezers and Googleization. Well, thanks a lot for having me. Good. So I asked you right before we started, and so we can continue this uh, this uh, a bit, Um you said the question you get most often is, what is a futurist? So we'll, we'll go with that, but then you can lead into, um, you know, how did you get into this? How, how did you get the, the title futurist? Well, that's an interesting question that I get all the time. Uh, and I, honestly, the, the title itself was kind of placed upon me as opposed to getting <laughs> the title. Um, I mean, futurists in various forms and shapes, like like Gerd Leonhard, uh, focus on uh, societal uh, projections and, and where things might be heading and just connecting a series of dots, which I think has never been more complicated given the pace that we experience today, uh, but doing so in a way that gives some some form of clarity to where things might be going. There's just no way to predict this stuff anymore. Uh, and so it's really, in my mind, uh, rehearsing that future and, and helping leaders to rehearse potential paths that it might take. And so that really, I think, crystallizes what a futurist does. And and I've been in my career mostly forward-looking in my roles, um, so I, I've had that ability to connect these dots. Uh, but I, I was never really thought of as a futurist. But in the last, I'd say, six or seven years, uh, you know, the marketplace started calling me that. So I, I went with it. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think you, you hit it on the head. I think people, you know, I've, I've been, that, that title has been laid upon me. <laughs> Uh, you know, several times. So you, you throw it up there on your on your list of titles. Uh, but people think that you can predict the future and then they look back and they go, you know, well, you weren't right about that. Right, right. Uh, and and there, there, there's a lot of things I wasn't right about, including in the present and in the past. But yep, yep. <laughs> as we go there, hey, uh, you you recently wrote a series of articles. And, and again, this you 
you've been doing it looks like uh, there's probably five or six that you've done on convergence uh that also resonated with me because we talk about the convergence of the wired tired and technology uh which is just small but it was fascinating because you have um i think it's you have so many graphs but i think there's an innovation wheel and you talked what what i thought was most dramatic was the comparison between information being the disruptor a um, hundred years ago and what information looks like now as a disruptor. So, you know, in the past, it was like television was a disruptor. Radio was a disruptor. Even the, even the telegraph was a disruptor. Uh, you know, and now we're, we're talking about some crazy things. But before we kind of jump into the, the nitty gritty, talk about um, convergence. You, you called it, it's, it, it, you know, it. I, I don't think you said it was was convergence was the emerging future, but um, it, it's certainly shaping it. So t- tell us about the, the convergence because you talk about the catalysts and historical moments. And, you know, I think I put a post out there about yeah. going back to the future uh, before you can go to go to the future. So. Yeah, so it's it's a fairly complex story, but let me start from the beginning. Uh, I think most historians would a- agree that the most transformative period in history, human history that is, was the second industrial revolution. So think 1870 to about 1970 in totality. And it was that um, that period that really set the modern standard of living. And so our prosperity that we've gained, really we've gained through that period of time. And what's fascinating about looking backwards to see forward is what transpired back then. First and foremost, the platform that emerged, uh, it it always has three big components, energy, transport, and communication. And when those three things change at the same time, really the platform for innovation changes. And so back then, it was basically the internal combustion engine, the telephone, and electricity. And on that platform, innovation really just kind of took off, but not nearly at the pace that we're seeing today. But in and of itself, that innovation could not have done what it what it did to the world unless other things converged with it. So, for example, um, societal uh, issues, uh, the business world, the economy itself, uh, politics, all had to converge in ways that facilitated the process of moving us towards this prosperous world. And one of the big things that drove that convergence, because I'm a big believer that humans don't do these things unless there are catalysts that drive it. And unfortunately, the catalysts back then were not very pleasant. It was uh, World War One, the Great Depression, and World War Two were the main mm-hmm. catalysts that that drove human activity, and then a big one. And I'll talk a little bit later about how I see this kind of repeating itself. The big one was the democratization of that innovation, because if you can't make that innovation available to the masses, then you know the inequality that we talk about today would have existed back then as well. So, so convergence basically says that all these domains have to come together to facilitate positive gains from the great inventions, and we'll talk about them in the past, uh, without it, um, they can take a number of paths, including some places that we don't want to go. So what are, uh, uh, let's not jump to the future yet. Um, we'll, we'll stick with that. You know, as, as you were talking, I mean, one of the things that um, I, maybe will help people uh, realize what was going on and see if you agree, um, you know, the smart, the technology for the smartphone was available i think the first idea for something like that came up in the 80s maybe even the 70s i read the origins of that um the problem is it didn't take off until the late uh you know uh, you know maybe 20 2006 i think 2007 somewhere maybe let's say in the last 15 years and one of the reasons was is we didn't have the bandwidth so you know, ideas come up and they fester and, uh, you know, they don't fester, but they just kind of smolder, I guess. Um, And, you know, and then all of a sudden it's the convergence of different ideas, uh, of different technologies, of different innovations that, um, you know, allow uh, something, some idea, some concept to, um, to boom. And, and it's funny because, uh, you know, I use the term Googleization a lot, but my the recruiting into Googleization was really going to just be kind of geek skeezers Googleization version 2.0. Uh, and I started to write it and I realized uh, I wrote uh, that the, the Geeks and Geezers book in 2009 and I had no mention mm-hmm. when I started to write it. I had no mention of the iPad. And I go, how can I not talk about the iPad and technology and mobility and all these things? Um, and I realized that it was just seven years earlier that it didn't even exist. Well, it didn't exist on the market. 
So, yeah, a- excellent. Can you, so what are, so you talk about um, some of these examples. Uh, let me see. I had, I had one of the charts pulled up here. So if we look at just one example, like television, so the standard of living, uh, which changed over that, I think you call it the special century. Is that right? Is that what you call Correct. it, that 100? Yeah. yeah. So, so that special century between 1870 and 1970, um, the information we got was through books, libraries, newspapers, and television. And if you think about it, almost every one of those is either going away or completely transformed. So, you know, books are on audio, books are digital, uh, it's no, you know, bookstores are closing, uh, there's, there's some unique parts of that, even libraries are getting cut back, uh, and so forth. But when you, when you look at the standard of living, uh, I guess, going forward, you're talking about data explosion, brain interfaces, new, uh, new computers, cognitive systems, um, can you, I mean, so where are we in that? I guess that new standard of living, because it seems that we've got some people stuck in the past and we've got people like you and me and Gerd and a lot of other people talking about going forward. Where are we in that transition? Well, it's another complicated topic, right? There are, are some that believe that the standard of living has been set and very little that we can do to really approve upon that standard of living. Now, I, I don't happen to agree, but there's a there's a compelling argument to be made um, for that position that, that individuals have taken. Uh, so the standard of living, for, for example, um, uh, eliminating uh, – child mortality uh, when we did back in, in that period that I was talking about, you know, some would say, well, that's about as big as you can get and, and making us uh, live longer just doesn't compare. It's just one compelling piece of an argument. Um, but the that innovation wheel that you mentioned, uh, I take a shot at the emerging innovations, uh, mapping them to our areas of well-being, if you will, like our homes, transportation, energy, clothing, education, et cetera, and, and taking a close look at what some of these innovations might do to indeed elevate our well-being, and not just in the Western world, which is where most of that happened, but uh, making it a global phenomena. So can we raise the standard of living across the world? And we're already seeing in places in the emerging um, markets where we're leapfrogging infrastructure and leveraging some of these innovations to already improve the standard of living. So there, I mean, a, a global view says that we can indeed improve the standard of living. You know, even in the Western world, uh, I, I do believe that uh, living longer and all the technologies that are emerging to help us do that is, is indeed improving standard of living if you can live longer in a healthy capacity. And I do believe that's where we're heading. Quick question for you, based off of that last comment. You mentioned, um, I'm thinking about maybe changing lanes here, but it, you mentioned a leaping forward with some of the uh, uh, some of the regions on, in the planet. And my curiosity is where you know going into the business world and and the conver- and and just the you know we're always talking about that battle between putting the human back in HR and the impact of technology here on the show. What do you see? maybe leapfrogging or something that we might think we, maybe somebody wrote off a couple of years ago in terms of business b- behavior and, and development. Do you see anything skyrocketing that might come up as a, a special, you know, sneaky thing that shows up that we weren't, we didn't think was going to happen? From You mean from a business perspective? And, yeah. And, uh, well, again, in these in these markets where the unbanked are are seeing an ability to bank, or where electricity doesn't exist, but we are bringing solutions to pr- provide electricity to those those places, or the internet, for example, doesn't exist, and you know satellites and other mechanisms are used to actually deliver internet access to these regions. Those are all new approaches that change the dynamic in those worlds, and as that dynamic changes in those worlds, then obviously the business opportunity changes with it. So. I think from a leadership perspective, having a view into where some of these things may go, and that's really the trick here, If in a future thinking capacity, what might occur? And if it occurs, how does it change the way we think about these things? And from a business perspective, what's the opportunity set and what's the risk? And those are really the big challenges for leaders. And at the heart of it is the pace phenomena. We haven't talked about pace, but that is the biggest challenge for any leader is that this stuff is happening so fast. And it changes the whole perspective on what the future means. So I have pace is the number one thing I have written down that I wanted to bring up. So I'm glad that you did it. Can you bring our audience up to speed with what it is when you mean, uh, what you mean when you say when you reference pace? Yep. 
So a lot of folks would say to you that periods of innovation have always been part of human history. And so there's nothing different about a period of innovation. What's different about this period is is the rapid speed at which these innovations are occurring. Now, some call it exponential progression, um, fueled by Moore's Law and some of the things that have occurred on the technology side. But in effect, what's really happening is that the building blocks, and, and and you mentioned it, Ira, when we talked about the, when you talked about the smartphone, the building blocks are are in effect there, and when the building blocks are there, they can be combined in ways very rapidly that create new forms of value, and so value is appearing very very quickly, and it's on the back of this combinatorial nature of building blocks, and so as that fuels the rapid speed at which these things occur, it represents a challenge to leaders that really just didn't exist before, and that is mm-hmm. that the pace phenomena, the rapid pace. Uh, is driving is driving change so quickly that it's hard for not just leaders to I- embrace it, but society at some level is going to struggle with the pace. Yep. So if if we can take that and and maybe you know kind of really laser focus on this, I mean we uh, something near and dear to my heart uh, question that I'm always asked is you know am I going to lose my job? Our our jobs you know we we hear the the studies that come out that, you know, robots are going to take 50% of all the jobs or, or even more than that, uh, which has a whole long, you know, list of <laughs> unintended and intended consequences. Um, I personally don't believe it'll be 50%, at least not in my lifetime or, or, or and maybe not even Keith's, <laughs> you know, he's, he's a little bit younger. But what what role, I mean, how is all this stuff, all, you know, all this convergent, how do you see it affecting jobs how does it affect the work we do? You know, so it improves our quality of life. But if we're, if we're still working and people are out of work, then that's not necessarily a, an improved quality of life. So, I mean, where do you see this fitting into jobs and work? So a very polarized topic uh, and obviously one that comes up no matter where I go. And it's polarized because there are those that believe that we have, as a society have experienced this before. And every time we've experienced this, we've found a way through it. And so from agriculture to industrial, we move from the farms to the factories, for example, and then from the factories to the office in, in the context of knowledge work. And so we, we've kind of been there and done that. I think the and the other side of this equation or discussion is uh, we've never been here, and that is that the kind of work that's coming uh, requires a, a special skill set that that most of the masses aren't prepared to deal with, and so that links very directly to the education discussion, and the, you know the topics of lifelong learning and reskilling society, and is our education system geared up for that? Uh, and so when I get asked the question, I think the main difference between this period and past periods is that skill set uh, phenomena. If many of the jobs that are created between now and let's say 2030, because that's really the period, the point in history or, or the future that I think is going to be a real challenge for us. In 2030, when automation has taken a big step forward, uh, what kinds of jobs are left and what skill set is required to do those jobs and can society reskill itself in order to do that? I think those are the, the, the key questions with a very, very direct linkage to education. So philosophically curious here. What do you think, I'm going to wager that the human pace is going to try its best to slow down the technology pace. And as we go towards 2030, do you think it'll work? Do you think that there'll be, you know, is it really one of those futures where if you're not uh, with this, you're against it? Or do you think that humans have a chance to slow it down? So this is one of those areas where you can't predict, right? I mean, and and so I'm very big on the notion of, of not predicting, but providing maybe some perspective. So between now and 2030, there's a number of demographic and other drivers that really contribute to a, a push toward automation. Just think in terms of, of lower fertility rates, the uh, aging of our society, the drop in the in working age population. All of those factors will at some point drive leaders to automate uh, between now and 2030, which is why I use that date as sort of an end point. And mm-hmm. the questions become, if those demographics persist and the drive toward automation accelerates, then by then, uh, what kind of world or society have we have we positioned for ourselves? And if if we deem that society can't absorb that pace and we're going to take uh, uh, steps to slow it down, those steps could be regulatory, they could be antitrust, they could be a lot of the things that we're hearing discussed right now. The bigger question becomes, from a geopolitical perspective, if the West does that, 
there's no saying that other places will do it as well. And then the competitive disadvantage that nations find themselves dealing with becomes a catalyst in and of itself. Man, I could talk to you for a long yeah. time. Yeah, no question. Yeah, actually, what you're doing, I, I had already written down about China, India, and, uh, you know, how, how does, you know, we, we don't control the world anymore. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure anybody controls it anymore, but you're absolutely right. I mean, it's not only the, the, the geopolitical, but just the political, uh, you know, the, mm-hmm. the, some of the things that are coming in. And I, I do believe that technology, uh, you know, some of the large technology companies need to at least be, I, I won't say governed, um, but, you know, even they admit that there's some regulations that they need. But, uh, you know, when, when Congress or any of these world bodies starts um, legislating oh, yeah. how they're going to act, um it's uh, I, I, I don't think it'll be very successful I don't, get I don't the, because they don't understand it. I, right. I don't get the impression that most people that are in charge of writing legislation know what they're talking yeah. about or I still go back to that example maybe they a, never a couple have. months ago when they interviewed Mark Zuckerberg and there were congressmen, mm-hmm. uh, you know, asking us how does Facebook make money. Right. <laughs> so, right. And, and uh, yeah, they so, never yeah, have. pretty crazy stuff. Hey, uh, we are uh, unbelievable. Uh, again, so many more questions to ask. We've been Keith and I have been jotting them down here. Uh, we are up against our break right now. You've been listening to the Geek Skeezers and Googleization show. Uh, we're talking about emerging trends. We're talking about the future. Uh, we're talking about how, how the past, uh, understanding the past leads us to understanding the future, what impact it's going to have on our economy, our jobs, our fut- uh, and, uh, you know, how we live. Yeah. Uh, we're taking a short break. We'll hear from our sponsors, Jobvite and Success Performance Solutions. Stay right where you are. We will be back in two minutes. Behind everything you're searching for is something you're actually looking for. When you search with the real Yellow Pages, you get more than a contractor. You get a whole new curb appeal. It's not just getting directions to a dry cleaner with YP.com. It's rescuing an old favorite from the back of the closet. And it's more than finding a locksmith with YP.com on your mobile. It's getting to sleep in your own bed. Whatever it might be, there are more ways to search and more ways to find exactly what you're looking for with the real Yellow Pages, YP.com, and YP.com on your mobile, only from AT&T. What's up, everyone? This is Keith from the Geek, Skeezers, and Googleization show powered by Jobvite. Jobvite knows career paths are made by people, not by open job requisitions. Jobvite's platform ties recruitment marketing directly to applicant tracking and onboarding, creating continuous candidate engagement that effectively connects recruiters with qualified passive candidates. Used by over 50,000 recruiters placing over 1 million jobs, Jobvite's platform impacts every company in every industry. Check us out at jobvite.com. Listen carefully. Up to 9 out of 10 job candidates visiting your company career page leave before completing an application. You heard that right. 90% of candidates who want to apply for a job at your company don't. That's just plain crazy, especially in today's tight labor market. Candidate experience matters. Stop turning candidates away. Let Success Performance Solutions help. Call us at 800-803-4303 or register at SuccessPerformanceSolutions.com slash W4CY. Schedule a no-obligation consultation and get special access to insider tips to recruit faster and hire smarter. Welcome back to the Geek Skeezers and Googleization show, everybody. We're with Frank Diana today. Ira Wolf is with me. This is Keith Campagna. For those of you that haven't yet called in, give us a shout out. It's 561-623-9429. We're talking, really talking about the future of work today and everything that comes along with it. You can also, have, if you have a question, go up to uh, yep, w4cy.com, W4CY. Yep. hit the live button, and then the chat button, and send us a question if you got one for uh, uh, Frank or myself or, or we, Keith. We've been getting questions these last couple, a bunch of podcasts yeah, now. It's yeah. kind of like what happens. It's Frank, like, uh, during the break, I thought to ask you what kind of specific elements keep your interest inside a business. What is it that, what, what have you been doing these days with as it relates to the business world specifically? 
So um, three three big things. It's all obviously tied to the future. One is um, an ability to see the future at some level. And so it's really getting leaders to understand that the way they think about the future is changing very rapidly. It's no longer yesterday's forecasting and three to five year plans. It's, it's really appreciating the fact that things are happening much more rapidly. And so everything's sort of in your line of sight, if you will. So seeing that future at some level and, and leveraging its foresight to inform how, how your business moves forward is, is one. The second, as I mentioned earlier, since there really is no ability to predict this future, how does a, a business rehearse it? And so the experimental, not afraid to fail kinds of discussions that are going on really all speak to this need to rehearse the future at some level so that we can start to understand potential paths. And, and it's an ongoing iterative process. And then lastly, um, because I'm a big believer uh, in the fact that they won't be able to predict. The only thing that we can predict is that these shifts will happen and they will happen quickly. The third area is how do organizations become resilient? I think that's the biggest thing any business leader can do today is is bake in resilience so that they can adapt as uh, these shifts occur. What time frame do you think this resilience needs to be given its due attention? <laughs> You mean yesterday? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, this is what happens. You're, you're, everything you say puts me in six different directions. Yeah. Here. That's an obvious <laughs> question. <laughs> but yeah, why? So, maybe, so how many yesterday? Right, maybe maybe my, <laughs> yeah. a better qual- question might be why yesterday? What, what's the risk that a company has if they're not paying attention to this type of shifting? So in the so at, at the risk of I just don't like this the fear mongering that goes around with transformation and disruption and all that stuff right and the bottom line is that that we were seeing through examples like the autonomous vehicle and I think that was one of the key drivers that have CEOs paying attention that even a scenario that seems very unrealistic in science fiction uh, is starting to feel very real to people and so as those things happen. Uh, it becomes very clear that a focus on that future and the fact that things are are going to change is becoming more apparent to CEOs. And so with it is this this notion that we can't possibly be as flexible as we need to be as these things occur very rapidly. And so the the compelling reasons for resilience, the compelling reasons for adaptability, which is not the strong suit of most traditional businesses, <laughs> right? It's becoming it's becoming clearer and clearer. So I, I mean that cl- that clarity is there, but the the struggle with how to get there is very acute. So what's the uh, other than calling you in, <laughs> you know, uh, what, what's the first step that, um, you know, I'm CEO of a, of, of a small business or, or even a large business, but we work with primarily small, medium sized ones. Um, what's the first, you know, what's the first step? I mean, what's the process look like? How do you, how do you get them um, to engage? <laughs> so this is somewhat of a vicious cycle because it, it kind of wraps right back to our conversation before the break. Um, you know, the the path toward resilience is really a lot of automation, a lot of cloud, a lot of leveraging insight in real time, uh, an ability to, when leveraging insight, respond rapidly. All those things are components, if you will, of an adaptive core. Uh, and so driving to that is critical. But that then starts the the discussion around if we do all these things, you know, what's the role of the human right. uh, in the organization, right? And and that brings a conversation um, that I think is, is a critical conversation, and that is humans and our very specific ability to be creative, to be entrepreneurial, uh, to be innovative, to be curious, all of those things. Uh, are, are things that humans will continue to do very effectively where machines can't, at least in the foreseeable future. And so it puts a focus on that aspect of HR, if you will. I mean, who, what are we, who are we recruiting? Are those the skill sets we're looking for? If we do find them, will they will they stay because our, our environment might be, not be conducive to that skill set, et cetera, et cetera? So we, we had a so – actually, somebody just responded and said computers have already taken over the workplace, yeah. which, uh, you know, I don't know if they've taken over or we've allowed know. it. And that's sort of my theme with keeping the, the human in HR is that my my kind of philosophy is, is that companies have turned to computers – uh, to actually to automate process to do the jobs of humans, um, and instead of allowing them to augment what uh, our abilities have been, they've the thought process was to to replace them. You know, to basically replace the humans. 
is, is so there's there's a lot of thought you know in the past and and you seem to be the expert on kind of looking back to going forward um in each previous kind of industrial rev you know the four revolutions but especially the industrial one there was always more jobs created new jobs uh created from that transformation they were different jobs Mm -hmm. Um, but there were more jobs and, you know, certainly the jobs that are being created are more skilled, but do you believe that, you know, once we get over this hurdle, um, that, you know, and it may never end, it may just be a continuous journey, but, you know, as we move on, will more new jobs be created that we just haven't thought about and, and enough to keep everybody busy or, or or is that a worry of yours? (laughs) I mean, there clearly will be a number of jobs that we can't even fathom uh, created as this all plays out. Um, whether they are, uh, whether they're enough, and whether they are jobs that the normal person on the street can do, are the big questions. And 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 honestly, because because I'm a big believer in not being able to predict, um, I I can only speak to what what could happen, right? But not necessarily what will will happen. Uh, and and the the notion of we've already you know computers already run our business. That's just not true. <laughs> I mean, we have definitely moved to automation at some level over the last twenty, thirty, you know, even forty years. But but the ability to automate knowledge work at the level that potentially we can automate with artificial intelligence and natural language processing and really taking the human completely out of the equation if we deem that that's where we should go. Uh, We've never done that. So, and again, so a follow-up on the chat was that, you know, well, look at McDonald's. They have self-serving or self-ordering stations. That's true. So, you know, it it hasn't completely replaced the the, uh, cashier uh, or the fast food operator. Uh, But, is now you have a machine that somebody built, somebody programmed, somebody has to repair it, somebody has to install it, somebody's always there to upgrade it. Um, And it's still, so if, if, I don't think fast food is very fast food anymore. I think you can take the fast out of it. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it, it, you know, the the lines are are pretty long. Uh, Some of it actually, I think is longer because of the automation, because people aren't comfortable with it. Um, But that's what I was, uh, you know, that's certainly, you know, what I was looking at is that, yeah, maybe the the cashier job uh, will be uh, either eliminated or changed dramatically. Maybe they can rely more on customer service at that point uh, or, or proce- get the food process faster. Um, but if you look at a kiosk, it's pretty complicated. And, and you just you need different people with different skills to be able to do that. Um, so uh, there, there was another – go ahead, Frank, Keith, you uh, had a question. A couple of weeks ago on the show, we had Noel Kellick and, um, oh, boy, Henry Henry Fairfax from the Philadelphia uh, mm, Revolution right. Project. And they're building out a school that is based off of system uh, education, uh, which is to say that – Design they, thinking. Design yeah, thinking. System thinking and design So how thinking. do you see – I know you're, you're big on the whole skill set phenomena. How do you see system and design thinking – uh, playing a role with businesses today. So if we go back to this building block uh, scenario that I mentioned before and the fact that everything today is part of a bigger system, and that's always been true, but the complexity of the system, the speed at which the system moves, those are all new phenomena, at least as far as I'm concerned. And so system thinking has never been more important. You have to be able to see the system uh, and not just the individual piece parts. So we spend a lot of time focusing on AI or 3D printing or the various pieces of innovation that are emerging today, but they, they really come together in ways that affect the entire system. And so an ability to see that entire system, I think, is, is one of those key skill sets. And design thinking is just a mechanism to help us do that. Um, but you hit on a key point. I really am a big believer that system thinking is one of the, the, the most important leadership traits going forward. So p- picking up on on uh, both you know, the revolution or the revolution school, uh, which uh, relies a lot on experiential learning. I think uh, you know one of the examples that uh, I can't remember if they gave it during their was instead of teaching people kids in a classroom how to do algebra and trigonometry in trigonometry. Uh, if I can talk, I can't even say I it. English. I can't even say it anymore. I, I did get an A in it at one time. Um, but, you know, so a lot of things I got an A in that I, I can't history. remember. That's called history. That I, that I can't remember shift, right? <laughs> so, so, um, but, you know, one of the, one of the things that, uh, how did we get there? Uh, one of the things that, that came out of that is that uh, they're, they're teaching kids skills just differently. What, what are some 
some of the, I mean, you mentioned curiosity before you mentioned resilience. What, what are some of the skills that, you know, people that are, that are listening, um, that they need, you know, that they should be looking at it developing and, you know, some of it's hard skills, but a lot of it's, um, you know, what they used to call on the soft side, which isn't so soft anymore. So. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I I always look at that from a left brain right right brain perspective, and where the left brain are those those logical uh, traits that the computer more than likely will take over, and the right brain being more of the creative, you know, empathetic, innovative side of our brains that really come into play more so than in the past, and so in the education system. How are we going to ensure that we're bringing out those those pieces of our human brain that can be really leveraged in in the, in the immediate future? Let's say the next ten or twenty years, and and a lot of people believe that our education system actually kills those right brain characteristics mm-hmm. along the way because as as children we are very creative we we you know we, we think in in ways that aren't inhibited or or blocked and when we go through education we get obstacles placed in our way that start to stunt our creativity. So I think the education system has to change considerably uh, in the next several years. Yeah, and Frank, when we got off, uh, when I got off the phone, I'm actually doing a podcast with, uh, and I mentioned it earlier, with uh, Diane Hamilton. Uh, and she has a new book. Um, I, th- I think it's out or it just came out. It's called Curiosity Code. Um, it, it might be one to, to kind of take a look at. But in there, she looked, I mean, it, it just hit on a great topic because, you know, it's pretty well reported that, you know, after like four years old, kids start, stop asking questions. You know, that that every young kid asks like a hundred questions a day to their parents. Right. <laughs> you know, why can't I? Why did I do this? Mm-hmm. Why is this? And then that, Delta- that, that curiosity there's a, there's a couple of thoughts. Is this curiosity get killed, uh, or do we teach bad habits? And and Diane came up with this acronym. It's called FATE. It's fear, apprehension, technology, and environment. And it's not that we lose curiosity. It's that there's other elements that that we introduce to a child that inhibits them from asking the questions. Sure. And, and obviously, some of us rebel and, <laughs> and ask them anyway, and, right. and, and some don't. But uh, yeah, that that was uh, I think that was, it was basically an amazing, you know, uh, amazing point. Uh, and I completely completely agree ahead. with that. Yep. No, I was just going to say I, I completely agree with her thought there. You know, it's funny as we're going on here, we're having a lot of activity in the chat room, and I'm, uh, I just want to make mention and share it with you that people seem to be somewhat conflicted with the idea that. Because systems are breaking, it's a bad thing. You know, we talk about edu- some people, we have a comment here that edu- the education system is a letdown, right? And a lot of people think that the political system is a letdown and, you know, the business economic greed that's out there is a letdown. I, I'm with you. You mentioned earlier that you're not into the fear mongering. I have this crazy theory. Other futurists have said things that, you know, th- we're still here and that love is the answer, as corny as that may seem, but the good guys haven't lost yet. What are some of the, you know, what are some of the more positive attributes you see coming with regards to the, to the shift? And, and so if I go back to that innovation wheel, and unfortunately we can't we can't all see it, but it's uh, it was my attempt to show. I, I'm going to post a link on in um, you know on the podcast, and yeah. we'll we'll have that up there. So. Okay, all right. Well, so in in looking at the innovations that could emerge and linking them to our areas of well-being, like like education and clothing and transport and and work and other other places, it's clear that we could we could better the world substantially. If we stay on a path of constructive use of these things and mitigate the risks of unintended consequences, and so that's why I'm a big believer that we could we could elevate our standard of living, our well-being, however we want to call that, uh, considerably if we follow the path that we're on, but it, do so in a way that's managed and a way that avoids the unintended consequences, because we know there's a downside to all this as well. Uh, so, so living longer, healthier lives is clearly a potential outcome. As a matter of fact, Ray Kurzweil is on a mission to make sure we never die, right? So, I mean, right. these are the kinds of things that people believe are possible. Uh, the education system could indeed be enhanced through virtual reality and other, you know, personalized learning met- met- methods that AI in- enables, right? So, all the, these things can be enhanced. But we know that with every positive, constructive thing, there's the opportunity for for damage, and humanity could go in another direction if we let it. 
Yeah. Sure. I mean, every one of these things we talk about could be weaponized. Yeah. Uh, which, yep. which is which is right. a scary part, but a lot of things in the past could be weaponized. Right. And like just like well. we have fire, but we didn't burn all the villages. We have guns. We didn't shoot everybody. Yeah. We're, we're yep. attempting. Some, it seems to be we're attempting it. Hey, Frank, we're we're going to come up pretty close to the end here. I've got one question, and then if you can um, share with everyone how it were the best ways to to get in touch with you, and then we'll kind of wrap this thing up. But my question is: is you mentioned earlier, uh, and I love this. Um, that we, I, I think you said we can't predict, uh, you can't predict, but we can rehearse the future. What are some, you know, for, for individuals listening here and, and, you know, get, even if you're a CEO, you're an individual that is going to take this down. What, what are some ways that people can rehearse the future? What, what, how do, how do they get more comfortable with it? I guess. So as simple as this may sound, um, but it just doesn't happen often, is uh, first is awareness. Uh, there's just not an awareness in the general population about some of these things that are emerging. And so awareness becomes very critical. And I think that's why you see so many futurists focused here. It's really on a mission to make more people aware uh, to the positive and negative outcomes that we could be facing with. And the second piece is education. You can't rehearse these things unless we're comfortable with uh, the understanding of some of what this might mean to us, right? Ignorance is our worst enemy in terms of where these things might happen. So, so um, rehearsing starts with awareness and education. And whether you're a business leader or, uh, you know, focused on the next quarterly result, which is an obstacle to awareness and education, or you're just an individual wondering what your children should take up in school, uh, you know, being aware of some of these things helps answer some of those questions or at least rehearse some of the paths. So be, beyond your blog and your YouTube channel and Gerd uh, Leonhard's book and his YouTubes, who, who else, who would you recommend that people um, look toward? So a couple good books and, and authors. Uh, the first one is a book titled The Big Nine. Uh, author is Amy Webb, who is a quantitative futurist and professor at NYU. Uh, that big nine talks about the nine big technology companies and how they're likely to actually steer the path that AI takes unless, unless something comes uh, to, to steer it in other directions. So uh, she's a great author and, and a really a good thinker in this space. The other one, um, and this is a fascinating read, uh, is titled AI Superpowers, China, Silicon Valley, uh, Silicon Valley and the New World Order, uh, Kai-Fu Lee. A Chinese individual wrote that book. It's phenomenal. And again, if if you take the time and invest the time to understand something like the China factor uh, and understand exactly what's happening as opposed to the rhetoric we hear in the news, uh, it starts to educate us and make us more aware. And I'll just leave you with one other one, which uh, it really links back to this notion of uh, linking history and, and the future, The Rise and Fall of American Growth by Robert J. Gordon, who's an economist, was a fascinating read, long read, but a fascinating read about that special century, the 100 years, and why it led to the standard of living that we all enjoy. And if you want a, a short summary of that and a reference to it, uh, it's your most recent article. Um, drawing a blank on what the name was, but if you go up to your the website, which is frankdiana.net, um, it's, uh, the, I think it just came out July 29th, right? Yep. It just yep. came out the other day. Yep. So uh, how else can people, I gave the website away, but how else can people get a hold of you, Frank? Well, also connect uh, with me on LinkedIn. Uh, always happy to take invitations. Uh, Frank Di- Frank.diana at tcs.com is my email address if they want to reach out through email. Those are the best ways to get me. Fantastic. Any final words of wisdom, advice for, for our audience? Uh, education and awareness. Um, these kinds of radio shows and other podcasts that I participate in are, are great vehicles for uh, educating folks. And so, so you guys are doing a great service. As I say every week, um, we're just scraping the ice, the tip of the iceberg. Love to have you back. Um, you know, as, as subjects come up, uh, we're, we're talking about doing some panels down the road and, yep. and some things. So and he's greatly local. appreciate it. He's a local guy. Yeah, yeah, we're, he's in we're, New we're nearby. Yep. And absolutely, uh, I mentioned Diana or Diane Hamilton is right. next. <laughs> kind of, uh, and uh, she's just down the road too. So, right. neighborhood. Yeah, we're talking to people all over the world now, yeah. and, and now we got a neighbor. So, so, yeah, so for the people out there that are listening, please understand that although this is a little bit of the unknown for a lot of you, the idea here is that there are people out there willing to help you as you navigate 
through what is the eventual future. It's not like this is, you know, Frank did a great job in not saying this is how it's going to be. Right. But basically, this is how it most likely will be. And if, and, and if anybody says that they they, they know they how it's going to be, don't believe them. Right, 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 right. right. <laughs> like everything so else. So have did. faith. And I, and again, I, I'm glad that we right. got those books recommendations because yeah, absolutely. And we'll be uh, we'll be talking about this a lot. Uh, this is what we talk about every yes, week, sir. and uh, and uh, definitely check Frank's uh, information out when the podcast goes up. Uh, we'll have a lot of these links in there, and uh, really appreciate you taking uh, some time today, Frank, and uh, for being so gracious. Thanks, uh, to be on the show. Thank you. Thank, thanks for having me. And I want to thank every all our listeners. Uh, we had a great uh, chat going. They appreciate all the uh, the comments from from Dan and Charles and Ann, and uh, and hopefully we'll continue that conversation in the future. Uh, we're always interested in hearing what's on your mind, whether you agree or disagree. Uh, there's often not a right or a wrong answer, and uh, we're here to learn from from you as well. Uh, let us know how you're doing. If you're interested in being a guest or a sponsor, uh, just sharing a few thoughts. Uh, get in touch with us on the website, uh, geekskeezersgooglization.com. You can also connect with Keith or me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, thanks again to Jobvite and Success Performance Solutions uh, for being our sponsor. And don't forget, we'll be back here next week, 1 p.m. Wednesdays, Eastern, Eastern Time on W4CY.com, and you can listen to all the podcasts on our, our website, geekskeezersgooglization.com, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, uh, who else, uh, Google Play. Join you, the movement. You, you, you name it, we're, we're on it. Until the next episode of Geek Skeezers and Googleization, this is Ira Wolf and Keith Compagna. Don't let the shift hit your plans. Mm-hmm.